Hi, if you're a VCE student, a Roll40 Plus in Specialist Maths is a great investment because it's one of the few subjects that scales well over 50. So in 2024, my Roll43 is scaled up to over 53 study score. But looking at my marks, you may be surprised by how many marks you can afford to lose over the course of the year and still get a roll 40 or above. Now, on multiple sides, I've gotten five to six requests for a video just on SM. So today, even though I've been putting it off, I'm finally going to open my statement of marks and we'll go through that together and see what kind of marks and strategies you need to achieve your desired study score in specialist maths. Throughout the year, I was either rank two or rank three in my cohort. My um, my school was a bit secretive about rankings, but you get the idea. Basically, as you can see here, um, for my unit three and unit four, I actually got 97 average exactly in both of them. And I want to note that that's a moderated average. So in my first sec, I think I got actually 85%, but then they push up the scores by however much percentage you need to make rank one hit 100 or something like that. So that's why my 97 average there was already slightly moderated. And then um, as you can see, it scaled down by one and that's probably because I bombed exam one. Actually, it could have been a lot worse. Like I could have been scaled down a lot more, you know, so that's fine. And I will say like literally the only time in the entire year that I was rank one for a sec was for the smaller, like for the probability sec. And I lost half a mark on that. Here are my scores for exam one. So um, looking through it, everything was correct except for two questions that I got completely zero marks on. Um, and one was worth six, the other was two. So a total of 72 out of 80. So the first question that I got wrong was possibly the easiest question in the entire exam because it was a straight show that question for partial fractions. Um, and if I had been doing it using the methods I was taught, this is what I would have done to get the right answer. So what went wrong? The issue is that I was doing this question on autopilot and I didn't slow down to think about using the form that they gave me. And I just went straight to trying to rewrite this part like this into partial fractions with um, repeated denominator the way I was most used to doing. And I didn't think critically about what I was doing. Um, and as you can see, this is along the lines of what I wrote in the exam. So I wrote, I tried to uh, resolve it into a different form. And that obviously led to many lines working out, much time wasted for a one marker. I, I was really panicking because I felt like I was cooked if I couldn't get this one marker. It's like, it's a show that question, right? So I did feel terrible about fumbling um, what might've been the easiest question. So my only comfort was that it was a one marker. So I was not going to throw away 10 entire minutes of my exam one on this. Um, but I did come back to it many times and try it as much as I could, but I just totally mind blanked. But so as you can see, this is what I was doing. I was trying to write it in not the required form. One other question I got wrong was everyone's favorite question about skew lines. Um, something funny is that in the entire year leading up to our exam, our specialist teacher told our classes like, guys, don't worry about these vector um, points, lines, and planes distance formulas. They are not going to show up on exam one, so don't bother memorizing them. That was his advice to us. And so obviously a lot of my classmates were like furious at him after leaving the exam. I don't blame him at all because I did actually memorize the distance formulas and then it was my own fault that I ended up not using the right one. So what you see here is when I read this question and I had so much time to read it, right? And you would think that I would comprehend in my mind that we're talking about 3D skew lines, but it didn't cohere. So I just tried to apply like um, 2D distance um, of two parallel vectors to it, even though that's clearly not the situation here, because it did not cohere in my mind that I was dealing with skew lines. And I must have read the word skew like a million times, and I did not use, um, you know, this formula. Try to maybe visualize it in your mind, because I didn't, and I just assumed I was dealing with 2D vectors the whole time for some reason. And that was one of my biggest regrets stepping out because that's three marks, a entire question lost there. And the top performers are going to be getting those three marks because this is a separator question at the very end of the exam. And isn't it such a waste if you actually memorize all your distance formulas for points, lines, and planes, and you just don't even end up using the right one when it does show up in exam one? 
Okay, on to exam two. So this is for multiple choice scores. It was 18 out of 20 multiple choice correct. Short answer, there was a total of three questions that I did not score full marks on. Question 1a, I lost a mark there. Possibly my graph was not flat enough or I did not go through that target square that they've highlighted. Question 3e, one mark loss. Final question, no marks. So a total of 160 out of 180. Famous still water question. I got one method mark because approach was right. Basically, I didn't take into account that cleanup began after five days. So I did not include that in the working. So to do it correctly, you would have to do the same thing. Okay, so um, by the end of that cleanup, it's uh, zero left, but you have to take into account its total time minus five. That's how much of the cleanup time that we had. Um, and then if you solve that on CAS, you will get the right answer that the total time by the end of cleanup is um, 8.4 days. And then to get your final answer, you just have to, you know, reread again what it's asking you. And then, yes, like it's how many days from the start of the cleanup. So I'll minus five even further than that. So we end up with 3.4 days. If you're a future student, this is for you. A lot of people got this question wrong because they misinterpreted what it was asking by surface area and coverage. So when I read it, I thought it was pretty straightforward. Okay, the coverage of the pollutant, that's only talking about that top circle, that top surface layer of the pollutant. But a lot of people thought that they also had to include the thin curved surface area that goes all the way around of this pollutant. Mind you, that's pretty negligible because this pollutant is only a few millimeters thick. So my advice is read really carefully. It's not just saying total surface area. It says coverage. Okay, coverage of the pollutant is how much of that top layer of the pond is it covering? The final question of the exam was another mind blank for me. At this point, I misinterpreted it as one of those um, distance from the mean type questions, but actually it's, you know, it's a, obviously a confidence interval question. So you're actually just saying, okay, let's set margin of error to one, plug in those values into the formula and solve for the unknown sample size. I can see the advantage to starting with probability so that you're in the mind frame for it and then you don't have to worry about it for the rest of the exam. Personally, for me, because probability was my fastest section, that's why I left it to last. But at the same time, I had no brain left by then, so that might have been part of my problem as well. So just think really carefully about what order you want to do your short answer in. Score summary in 2024, these were the scores that would safely get you uh, above a 40 but not quite a raw 45. So as you can see, stacks are pretty important. They can help carry. And the only tragic part of this, I guess, is that my exam one score was at the very end of the um, A plus cutoff. So 72 was the tipping point between A and A plus. But other than that, this will hopefully give you an idea of what you need to aim for to get your desired score. When it comes to sex in Spej, I think what you need to understand is you don't even need to be rank 1 and there's a pretty big jump from unit 1-2 to, to unit 3-4 just in terms of the difficulty of sex, investigation style sex, where you know you just lose marks here and there. You will see like you know a 10% um, drop in the average mark compared to unit 1-2 and unit 3-4 for every sack. Like everyone bombs a little and that's okay. Like in my school, um, our very first sack, the highest mark was not even in the 90s. It was still high, but a raw, unadjusted sack average of high 80s, okay? That will give you the best chance of securing a raw 40 or above. Special sacks are especially draining because you have them in a series like oh, you know, two hours this week, two hours the next week. And then if you get the first sack back in between and you realize how many marks you lost, it's easy to get dispirited, but you should actually use that as more motivation. Like, okay, so this is how many marks I lost in part one. Calculate, okay, if I still want an A plus or an A, I can not afford to lose any more than this in part two. A lot of people say sex don't matter, don't worry about it, but I would treat it seriously because and I say this because you never know what will happen to you come exam time. And I lived that with English when I took it early. I treated every sack really seriously, made sure to keep my rank one, my 100 average. And I was right because then I fell really ill during exam time and I had to get a derived score for English. I was really grateful to myself that I had pushed myself so hard 
throughout the year to keep rank one and everything because that ended up you know saving my score in the end so don't get in the comfortable mindset of oh these are just sags like all these marks will get thrown out I just need to focus on the exam. No, how about you lock in from day one and take every sack seriously because every sack is like a test run for your exam. To lose as little marks in investigation sacks, literally the key is just yap as much as you can. Your teacher, your marker is looking for specific things. Don't be content with like, you know, doing just the bare minimum on each investigation, like just following the dot points and just writing a little sentence at the end. Don't be afraid to go into detail, you know, like you have a mini investigation on confidence intervals, then sure, like come up with more than just the minimum required amount of example confidence intervals, you know, maybe play with the margin of error a lot. They're called depth marks, right? If the more you yap, the more you explore, the more depth marks you get it's better to vet out your answers as you're going through than leaving it all to the final check. Um, where by then, you know, maybe you, you know, your calculator page has scrolled far beyond that and you need to get in the like mind frame of each single question all over again. Like most people, I kept a spreadsheet of the practice exams that I did, it's like roughly one or two per day leading up to, and then like maybe three or four per day in the days just before the special exam. I did a total of, I think, 14 exam ones, 13 exam twos. So definitely not as much as I would have liked to maybe. I don't think I counted everything that I did either. But the most important thing is actually not just logging what you do, but logging your mistakes because that will help you know what to look out for in the final thing. So as everyone says, it's the importance of review. That's the only reason you really do the spreadsheet. Mental arithmetic was something I really wanted to improve to save time. So I bought exactly a one month subscription to Mental Maths and I think it was seven or nine dollars. You have like hundreds of um, ways to customize and mix and match your own worksheets. I spent a lot of time on the mixed fractions and the negative and positive numbers worksheets and tried to do at least 200 questions a day. I did see a bit of an improvement in my mental maths speed. All my reference books were a combination of handwriting and digital, so first for each chapter, handwritten notes, and I handwrite so that it drills the content and the concepts into my brain. And then the next few pages after, I sort into little subtopics and give example worked questions, whether that was printed screenshots from the textbook or worksheets, or um, what I just cut and pasted. I used a spiral comb. The advantage of that is that it still meets the regulations while still being um, technically adjustable. As a um, Texas user in a Casio Classpad school, I spent a long time creating my own UDFs and I regret that I didn't just go to Lazy Maths earlier. This is what all the, well, most of the BCE students are using for free UDFs. These are amazing. Obviously, you won't use all of them, but I found these ones extremely, extremely helpful in cutting down time with the um, loci and the conversion from you know, loci form to Cartesian, etc. It will save you so much time, especially for multiple choice, and especially this one about projectile motion. It literally takes care of your entire, those long lengthy projectile questions. It will write out even your steps of working for you. Like don't expect UDFs to save you, but at the start of your year, don't be like me, download all of these, take the time to install them and get good with them and you will thank yourself later. What I've shown you so far is essentially all the resources I had for that year. I didn't even buy checkpoints because I just felt that it was a repackaged version of the old exams. I didn't have a tutor. You do not need a tutor, um, but if you feel like you do, absolutely. And out of all my subjects, I did not have tutoring except for methods and I felt that that was enough support for me in the maths department. How do SM and methods compare? Well, a lot of my friends who did only methods, they would always be surprised when I told them that I was having more fun and less work in SPESH. Vika has this hierarchy of maths and it puts SPESH on the top. But the thing is, like, in Unit 1 to SPESH, we were just chilling in class. Like, um, SACs, in my school at least, were easier for SPESH than Methods 1-2. Like, genuinely, they were easier to score better in and lose no marks in. Workload 
Personally, for me, specialist maths was my lightest subject out of all of mine. Uh, for context, my subjects were um, English, methods, chemistry, French. Yeah, that was it. Um, and so actually, in special class, my friend and I had made a point to always finish all our homework during um, free class time. So that's something I couldn't even dream of doing with my other subjects. Like for my other subjects, I always had a big load to take home. Not to sound like special pilled or anything, but I would say like absolutely a lot of people who are even only like average or even below average students in methods, they're taking specialist as well. So it's a it's a competitive cohort. It's not as competitive and not as elite or whatever as you might be scared that it is. You could be like me, like I didn't take special voluntarily, but basically my school forbid us from continuing with the accelerated methods even though we were at the top of the cohort like all three of us so like even though we were mugging the people in the year above us they were like you can't continue that you're going to take a specialist one two instead so that you don't you know fall out of touch with maths so basically long story short i did not even take specialist one two voluntarily but then like i realized i loved it when i did should i take spesh just ask yourself, can you bear maths? Can you imagine taking two of them, making two reference books? And if you can, then just go ahead. Like you have everything to gain. It's a really fun subject. You will likely find yourself loving at least some of the really cool topics in it or, or complex numbers. But I promise you there will be something in there for you. Like I really loved the probability and statistics part of it, especially. And that got me really interested in like actuarial science and stuff like that. So being a genius and being in love with maths are not prerequisites for spesh. So if you like the idea of crazy scaling and a subject where you're learning really cool new stuff every single day. So with all these benefits, I really, I can't think of many reasons not to take specialist, honestly. But look, in the future, I might put up even more videos once I like remember um, and recollect everything that I actually did in detail during this year to make sure I was study maxing. But um, as for that, I think for my next video, I will go into methods and open my statement of marks for that. So please do subscribe for tips and strats on all my subjects and just study maxing and getting a 99.9 .9 ATAR um, in general. Yeah, stay safe. Please like and sub and comment uh, any requests and I'll see you soon.